So the, the idea and the format here is that I'm going to ask a set of questions to John and then John will try and answer those questions. We'll, we'll certainly answer them eloquently. And then we'll open it up to the floor. So we'll spend about half an hour maybe on the, on the fixed questions and then open it up then to sort of more open <coughs> questions for people from the audience. So there's a couple of different themes we were going to, to, to try and get John's insight into. First was joining up the consumer and competition policy. How do the two work together? The next one then is competition policy with the new technologies and disruptive change that's happening right across the economy and many economies across the world. The next one then is politics and political economy of competition and regulation. How do we deal with the new politics, not only here locally, but also, again, globally? And the last one, I thought, just given where we are at the moment, we had a lot of questions on Brexit. And it was great. Hopefully we'll get John's great insights into Brexit. I'm not sure you'll have all the answers, John, but at least we'll, we can get a, a, an insight into where we are at the moment. So let's start off <coughs> with com consumer and competition policy. So the first question, really, John, is we, we've seen the experience you know, of the evolution of, of regulation. I mean, the UK was a leader here. You know, over the last 20, 25 years, you know, you've seen the split up of the industry, the creation of sectoral regulators, competition coming right the way through. So what does that look like today from a consumer perspective, given what we've already seen happen? Thanks, Eric. It's very nice to be back here. Tom Arnold reminded me that I was here. I spoke here um, last in 2007, but um, when I was at the Competition Authority, our offices were, and the CCPC is still um, just here in Parnell Square. So it's very nice to be back on uh, familiar turf. <clears throat> I mean, when when I was uh, when my parents had me and moved into a new house, they waited four years for a telephone instrument. And it wasn't because telephone instruments required four years to make, but because there was a monopoly um, on telephones. And if you knew a local TD, you could get it faster. And the UK really led in, in that um, breakdown or breaking up of the relationship between state-owned monopolies and the government and trying to get markets to deliver things that had been you know, post-war and earlier seen as things that only the state could deliver. And maybe it was right that only the state could deliver them then. And the UK started that, and it certainly had a huge influence in Europe. And I think there were enormous benefits um, from the liberalisation happening in the UK um, and, and consequently in the European Union. So you, you see, for example, how uh, telephone charges have fallen, airfares fell, <clears throat> new entrants entering those markets. So I think it was a really fantastic thing to do. But my view now is that the, the sector regulators in the UK are inimical to the interests of consumers and the way that they operate. And, um, and I've thought this for about five years. I spent um, uh, six months advising David Cameron on economic policy, and one of the papers I took to the Cabinet was a proposal to abolish all the sector regulators. And he stopped short of doing that, but agreed with a lot of the rest of it. Um, and I'll tell you what I think the problem is. Though, first of all, the UK has given all of the regulators consumer and competition powers, and they don't use them. Instead of going and enforcing the regular law, they write the conditions into the licenses of the firms so they can control them ex ante. And that has made the firms slightly dependent on um, the regulators. So the regulator is a bit of a puppet master with the, the firms on one side, the sort of punch of the market. And it's become increasingly a puppet master on the consumer side as well. We now have got to the stage in the UK where consumers who don't switch are seen as problem. And they're a problem for the regulator, and the regulator has to make them the switch in energy. As opposed to saying, if you're getting ripped off in the market, do something about it. We've now got to the stage of the government's problem. And I remember when I started the Competition Authority, there was high inflation, and the government put in an order on the price of the pint. This was in 2001. And I remember a piece of RTE footage of a guy sitting in a pub um, in Dublin, who was probably the stag's head, saying, a pint of Guinness is five pence cheaper across the road. And what's the government doing about that? <laughs> and, <laughs> um, so, you know, but, um, so we've no competition law enforcement. They've become more and more interventionist. And the very existence, and by the way, the people running them are all good friends of mine. It's not about the individuals, but they've become um, like a, a lightning rod for all of the political um, desire to intervene in markets. And because they exist as they do, um, the politicians um, have to do something with them. So let me contrast... In 2010, 2009, Gordon Brown, 2010, David Cameron, and 2011, David Cameron, all of them were very upset with rising energy prices. And so 
um, they went and got um, lots of things done in by, by Ofgem in the UK. But petrol prices were going up, and they kept putting pressure on the OFT to do studies of the petrol market, and I refused on the basis that there wasn't a problem, we weren't going to do it, and we were able to withstand. But the reg- energy regulator couldn't. So, you know, petrol prices were going up, and domestic energy prices were going up, and domestic energy prices got all of the, the heat because there was a regulator there to do it. And I think over time what's happened is the regulators are also then required by law to do lots of consultation. And so what we now have is that any – I advise that companies in energy telecoms – The regulators produce 100-page documents to consult on, more or less on a weekly basis. Only industry and deciders can do them. Inside the companies, the people whose careers do well are the people who understand regulation. They have no incentive to change anything. Um, BT has just appointed an independent chairman for open reach. They've gone and picked somebody who's an ex-member of the Ofcom board because they obviously consider that in order to restructure and make open reach more efficient, it's better to have somebody who's been on the board of Ofcom than somebody who's actually driven change within the industry. So we don't have people running these companies anymore who are really skilled in change management and driving efficiency. And so there's chronic inefficiency inside them. We don't have, I mean, I, you have far better um, internet access in most parts of Ireland and 3G access, 4G access than you have in the UK now. So the UK having been an early leader with a model that really worked well has let that model live beyond its useful life. And so my proposal to Cameron, and still is my view, and by the way, it also makes entry really difficult and it makes it impossible for organisations like which the Consumer Association to engage in these consultations because they're so technical. So my proposal then, and still is, that they should have one single access regulator for access to critical infrastructure that's cross-sector and move the competition consumer powers back to the Competition Markets Authority. And I know I come from a competition background, but that's what I would do. Those criticisms don't necessarily apply in Ireland. Ireland's at a different stage of development, so I don't mean to imply that here. But um, there comes a point at which you say the system has outlived its useful function. I think we've got there in the UK. And I, I think that will happen, but it just may not happen soon enough. It might take another five or ten years before people wake up to it. Okay, so a question that's somewhat related to this then, John, is really what the effect of the crash has had on regulation more generally. You know, you mentioned about the sort of the, 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 the puppet master for uh, uh, you know the regulator as, as long as we're not punching duty I suppose it's not so bad but it, to what extent has that you know crash changed the, the, the balance between producers and consumers and it was, is there a perception that the producer is much more powerful now post the crash and is there something we should look at as regulators in that context I mean, the, the, there's a lovely um, book by Giuliano Matta, former Italian Prime Minister, called um, Antitrust and the Bounds of Power. And he makes the point that in a liberal market democracy, you give people economic freedom, and they use that economic freedom to become economically powerful, and then they use that economic power to get close to politicians, and that causes the decline of democracy. And he said that the, the reason why the Sherman Act came about in the United States was to deal with the trust that had grown up in the late 19th century. And he makes the point that the origins of the the founders of the European Union wanted a strong framework of state aid control, competition rules, in order to protect um, democracy more than just to protect consumers. And I think in the financial crisis, you've seen um, actually not just the sort of producer interests grow, but you've seen them grow in a way that damages democracy. And you see that in the States, you see it with the Brexit vote in the UK and so on. And, and I, I think it has, you know, the independence of regulators being undermined. I, in seven years at the OFT, every single year there was a report from, some official report commissioned by government um, proposing a redivision of our responsibilities, taking some powers away usually and giving them to somebody else. All of them incremental, um, and I'm not opposed to institutional change, but, but not incremental so, and so every year I had to be careful what we did, what we said, because somebody was going to get a wedge in and start bringing about institutional change. And so we don't have institutional stability. And in a time of crisis, that becomes more acute because it's very difficult to run an agency independently if Parliament is constantly redoing your boundaries. I think consumers have got even weaker. Um, <clears throat> If you look at uh, in 10 years ago, which the Consumer Association in the UK was very powerful because it was the only person doing price comparison and product comparison work. And it could use the revenues from that to cross-subsidize its advocacy work. And it had specialists in financial services, energy, telecoms. Now we have price comparison websites, which doesn't have that money anymore. And actually, there's almost no consumer advocacy um, in the UK. So, so that's quite difficult. Um, so, yeah, I think... 
we're in quite a bad space with that, and I think the the, the politics at the moment do not favour independent institutions, and you see that in the UK with the attacks on the Bank of England um, over the summer, the attacks on the Office of Budget Responsibility, and so on. So it's um, it's a you know it's there is a risk that what Amato said is coming to pass, and that's also true. I mean, I, I, I don't want to get into too much the Apple tax case. I'm giving a speech about it next week. But the way in which Vestire handled that case, the way she treated the Irish government, um, the way she's stopped using state aid control to deal with steel in Germany, railways, and a whole lot of other industries that are close to the German and French government, and she targets this particular type of taxation, it's just deeply political. And so I fear that the Commission is sort of foregoing its competencies in the areas where it matters most for democracy and actually doing things that are very populist as well. So I think we're seeing that at a European level. And I say that as somebody who's very pro-European, it distresses me that the European Commission is not behaving better. Um, but so I think we're seeing independent institutions that should be independent um, being um, uh, threatened by politics. And, and that feeds into the next question then about the, sort of the role. Is part of the solution, certainly in competition, you've got a single strong entity for, for imposing and, and, and enforcing competition law, would If we had something similar on a consumer end, in some sort of pan-European, if we look at VW and some of the scandals there or whatever, is that, is, would that be better than what I we mean, have at the moment? Absolutely. The, the, um, the, the, company, the consumer responsibilities in Europe got split between three different commissioners and the Juncker Commission. And I actually gave a, wrote a paper about this at the time saying it was a, you know, they should be together. And it's, I, I don't want, I wouldn't want enormous amounts of centralization. I think the decentralization competition law is a very good thing. And the decentralized consumer law is a very good thing. But the current situation in Europe is a really fragmented consumer policy at the center of Europe. And that's not good for the citizen because it means that on, they, they interfere in things like roaming where they have the instruments to do so, but they fail to deal with things like Volkswagen. So I completely agree with that. And I also think having DG Comp, John Moore joined up with the consumer side would be better. It's something I've, I've, I've long talked you know. The other question then, that's sort of the last question then on this consumer competition piece is when we talk to industry, we turn around and they say, well, we're champions of the consumer and industry comes back and says, oh, actually your job is to promote competition. How do the two work together and is there a tension between the two or, to, or how can we ensure that they complement each other? I don't think regulators should be advocates for the consumer, but I think they should be. I think it's better if, if regulation is there to promote the interests of consumers um, rather, I mean, pr- if you promote the interests of producers, you're on a slippery slope to nowhere. Um, and, you know, I've always thought that a competition authority that has consumer powers, there's, there's a number of benefits from having them together. And one is that um, problems in markets are not always, you look at a problem in a market, it's not always solved um, by just one instrument. So uh, probably the best example of this was drip pricing in airlines. So people remember back in the mid middle of the last decade, airlines... Ryanair in particular, were charging you know, ridiculously low amounts, um, close to zero for airfares, but then adding lots of extras, so you paid £70. Pounds. But you didn't get them until later in the booking. And that was intense competition. And intense competition um, without you know, fair grounds of engagement vis-a-vis the consumer can actually be bad for the consumer. So what we did was we intervened with our consumer powers and said, you, if, if something's essential to the fare, it has to be in the upfront price. And as a result, we, we stopped a lot of that trip pricing. Now, Ryanair ran around that, and other airlines ran around it with credit card fees and seating charges and even speculated about toilet charges. But we then did an evaluation, and our evaluation showed the consumer saved $120 million a year from the increased competition that resulted from that, because people could p- compare prices more easily. But if we'd just been a competition authority, we couldn't have done anything about that. And I think it would have been really difficult for a consumer-only authority to have had the intellectual... Um, an analytical apparatus to have understood the competition dynamic was that important because the, those evaluation numbers surprised me. We had often evaluation numbers that surprised me negatively, but those were surprisingly good evaluation numbers. And it was actually an example of a consumer intervention increasing competition. Um, another example of that was the government liberalised um, directory inquiries in the UK back in 2002. As a result, the prices went up by about tenfold. Even the incumbent managed to increase their prices. Um, it was a really bad. Um, liberalisation and the, the problem was as with other liberalisations people hadn't thought about, about the consumer side enough we did that as well with mobility aids the government in the UK decided rather than buy wheelchairs for people um, where they got a bulk discount give them the money and let them buy their own people buying wheelchairs are very prone to um, doorstep selling and doorstep selling is a notorious form of ripping off of vulnerable consumers 
And so we found that they were paying on average 50% more than the government was paying for the mobility aids. And so, you know, well-intentioned moves to empower consumers and so on that don't think about both, not just the competition aspects, but the consumer aspects together. So I'm a big fan of them being done together because I think you get better answers. Um, and um, I know that, um, you know, that's happened here. It's the way it is in the UK um, to a large extent. And I think in you know, Canada, Australia <clears throat> and the United States, um, competition consumer powers are joined up. And I think the agencies there are stronger for that. So one of the things you touched on in responding to that was, you know, the technology and the descent that we're seeing disruption coming through from technology. We've got our group of uh, regulatory network, um, and we're sharing, we're seeing more and more cross-cutting areas across the various uh, areas that we regulate. Take, for example, a consumer trying to use some sort of financial uh, transaction on their mobile phone. So you've got uh, a transaction that's financial. You've got the mobile phone, which is in the comm sector. You've got competition issues. You've got sort of data, data privacy issues. If they can't charge the phone, it becomes an energy market issue. And, they're, they're, and yet the consumer is just doing one simple thing. They're just doing a transaction on their phone. So how can we try and adapt for this rapidly changing environment? What's, what's your suggestions? I mean, I think, so I'll, I'll talk about Uber. Uber's a client of mine, and um, so I, I, and I, as people may know, I have a long-standing interest in taxi markets, so it's the, um, <laughs> I, would, I would advise them for free because I, <laughs> I still like taxis. Don't, don't, don't tell them that. Um, but, so what's really interesting about, so if you, if, I, and, and Halo here is a bit the same. So it does a number of things. So first of all, um, Uber gives you um, levels of quality. One of the things that, I mean, I think taxi regulation here went really sharply downhill after I left the country. Not because, no causality, but um, just coincidentally. <laughs> but, you know, I don't see why. I mean, I get Uber cars all the time in London. I don't need things painted on the door. There are a cost increase. Some people might like that. Some people might not. But why do you have a regulator imposing a quality standard? It excludes poor people. So on. So one of the things you get with those, with Uber is you get a variety of quality. Um, from Uber Pool right up to Uber Lux, and the consumer can choose the quality they want. Secondly, because you have a rating system, because the rider rates the the um, the driver and the driver rates the passenger, everybody behaves incredibly well, um, and um, and they value their their ratings, and you can get excluded if you don't behave well. Thirdly, um, it's for regulators, it poses a big opportunity, but also a huge challenge. So let's just take the issue of wheelchair accessibility um, for, for taxis. The way we currently do wheelchair accessibility is in a really clumsy way around vehicle standards. So in London, it's 100% uh, mobility. But even there, the cost of loading and unloading your car when somebody's in a wheelchair as opposed to able-bodied um, is, is higher. And so people in wheelchairs still find it difficult, especially at peak times, to get taxis. But with um, an Uber-style technology, and sorry, Dublin does it, Ireland does it differently. We have minimum numbers of taxis that are accessible and we reduce the license charges for them. But we still don't change the marginal incentive for a driver to pick up somebody who, who uses a wheelchair or has another um, disability that requires um, some extra assistance. But with a technology like Uber, you can say to Uber, we want you to report back to us on the average wait times of people who are booking, who call themselves differently abled or whatever, and the average wait times of able-bodied passengers, and we want you to report the difference, and we want you to get that dif difference, um, you know, constant. But r r the people who currently regulate vehicle standards, the individuals inside the regulator, are not the people who are going to be doing big data regulation. <laughs> and so that's a big challenge. So there's a huge opportunity there to get much, much better outcomes for the consumer, to, to basically use these quasi-market mechanisms that exist on these platforms to deliver much better outcomes. But it requires a totally different skill set within the regulator. And so um, taxi regulators all over the world are struggling with this because they're mostly at a city level. They're mostly very small. And they totally lack the resources and capability to switch their regulatory focus. And there's some risk in switching your regulatory focus like that. So I think that's one example where there's a problem for regulators. Another, um, an uh, another example to look at is what the Financial Conduct Authority has done in the UK with its regulatory sandbox. And this was a, an, actually an idea I had when I was advising David Cameron that we took to the, the Financial Conduct Authority. So the Financial Conduct Authority has, has created a sandbox and a unit for dealing with, with financial technology startups. And what they're doing is they have a unit where anybody who's running a fintech business can go to them and talk to them. They help them through the licensing process. Um, they allow them to operate 
in a safe space, so they don't have to get fully regulated and fully licensed, um, where they're under a different type of control, because they recognise that they won't fit into one regulatory model. So if you take peer-to-peer lenders as an example, a peer-to-peer lender takes money from me and then lends it to you, um, so it is both a lender and a borrower, and it then has to get a license to a credit license and a license as a, more or less as a bank. And so what they've done is they've created a new type of um, quasi license for peer-to-peer lenders, but they they just keep them under a slightly tighter leash in other ways, and um, and it's a really good model for what um, what regulators can do. So I think there's lots of opportunities there, but it requires quite a lot of creative thinking by regulators, and it's a challenge for smaller regulators. Um, compared to larger ones, because you know larger regulators have the, the resources and bandwidth to do this. The final point I'd say is that there's the other side of the coin is that disruptive entrants like Uber and Airbnb could behave a lot better. And you know, Airbnb has now, yesterday, woken up to the fact that it is able to regulate 90 days a year. So we help we we um, worked for a company called One Fine Stay, and we helped them. Um, supported them in getting persuading the government to bring in legislation allowing 90-day lets uh, for short-term lets. You can let your house up to 90 days a year. But Airbnb said, well, we can't monitor that. And the government has basically then said, well, you might lose your license to operate in the country. So yeah, yesterday they said they could do it. They shouldn't have to be drag kicking and screaming to this. And it's actually one of the challenges you can have in regulating disruptive entrants is that you get a race to the bottom. And then finally, there's a huge issue for labour market regulation because you're getting this economy... Um, it started with um, eBay and it's in Airbnb and then it's more acute with uh, taxi drivers where you have people earning small amounts of money doing an array of small things and sometimes some big things, but they're totally outside of labour market regulation. So you're seeing in the UK HMRC revenue falling. Um, you're seeing concerns about social dumping and people not being protected on pensions, maternity cover, everything else. And I don't think the regulated company, the, sorry, the disruptive companies have been as good as they could be at coming up with, with um, appropriate solutions that all that and they're getting better at it. So we want to try to sort of explore then a bit politics and sort of how politics impacts on regulation. One of the things we're seeing, and I think it's sort of true right across Europe, is this loss of faith in institutions. Um, European institutions, to some extent, we, we, we're challenged locally in, in, in various member states as well. Is the solution to that that we would try and have more independence? So it's some of these sort of, like say, take DG Comp, should it be an independent agency? There's a, a, a parallel question here around data and facts and evidence, and we try and provide as much information to show decisions. But there's a loss of faith in experts. There's a loss of faith in expertise Generally, you know, we've seen this in the UK where people say Brexit and the say Brexit. Oh, look, that's just the view of experts in a, in a sort of a dismissive way. How do we try and adapt to this changing political environment? And is is it changing the institutions the solution? Well, I mean, uh, first on 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 independence, I'm a big fan of independent um, regulators and. I, I think looking at DG Comp now, and going back to my earlier comment, I would be absolutely in favour of DG Comp being politically independent because I don't think it's ever been fully politically independent, but it's got worse um, under the last two commissioners. And um, so favour that. But I think independent bodies require very careful thought about how you manage them. And at the beginning of independence, things work very well. But as it goes on over time, um, it can get more challenging. Because you know politicians change, the people who put in place the independent organisations will value them, but then the next generation of politicians may not. So I think it's very important to have really clear um, lines of engagement with government departments. It's very important that the right issues go to the right place. So if there's distributional questions, so uh, uh, the it's a very simple example in, in regulation is things like universal coverage. Um, you know, anything that involves redistribution of some, you know, taking money from one person and giving it to another, that is best to be something that's decided by the government and um, ideally implemented at a government level. And then the regulator might very well advise on that, but it should all be quite open and transparent. I, I think it's quite useful to have a um, formal communication system between regulators and government so that the government writes and sets out a strategic steer for the next three or five years or whatever. The new government say, but these are the things we care about. But the regulator, in terms of enforcing the law, is fully independent. Um, 
And similarly, when the government is designing a system to do some redistribution, that the regulator is able to inform it with who's going to be affected and how much and give them the data. And I was always struck um, at the OFT that we would do things that would benefit, you know, we'd, we'd enforce the law in one area and it would benefit one group of consumers and not the other. We were very bad at explaining to the government who was losing out. And if you look at in the UK at the moment, we have this concern with inert consumers in financial services, um, telecoms, you know, people with landlines and telecoms are current issue, energy, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But the regulators in the UK, and I've said this to them privately it, it, over the last few months, they don't know if it's the same consumers across all of those markets. Are, are the people who are inert in energy, inert in telecoms, and inert in um, in credit markets? Because if they are, you have a slightly different problem. Um, but if they're the people who are with the monopoly, the legacy monopoly supplier in each case, then it's a sector-specific, sector-by-sector issue. And I don't think the regulators in the UK have got together to answer that question. And that's a really important question to know for policymaking. So I think there's a lot to be done um, by regulators grouping together, by having a lot more clarity between regulators and government around those issues, um, but actually having um, widespread um, acceptance of the principle that independent regulators are good because... Politicians, when they do get involved in markets, really, um, you know, it's protect me before I kill again, <laughs> you know, um, type of arrangement in, in, in a lot of these markets. And politicians sort of know that. Um, and I think they're quite happy in principle to give up power, but they want to know that they still have some levers and they want to know, they, they want to understand what they're getting for it. And I don't think they often get enough for it. So we touched on politics then in the context of how people feel about the institutions. And obviously independence helps in that. But I suppose we, let's talk specifically about the political changes coming up from Brexit. I think we feel feel it quite strongly here in Ireland. I think the concern we would have, and each of us as regulators deal very closely with our European counterparts. And to, to be honest, we quite rely heavily on our UK counterparts as part of that process. There's a natural alignment in many times in the way we look at things. You know, we've got some sort of shared history that helps the way we view stuff. And it, what does that look like once we lose the UK as a strong voice? I mean, do we? It, does the does the, the the way that the that the EU develops become different once we've lost the UK at the table as part of the the formulation of of regulatory strategy or more general policy level? Um, I mean, you know, living in the UK for eleven years, it's, it's quite interesting comparing the mood in Ireland every time I come back. You know, a little bit of distance and things and. Now that I advise businesses, I see a lot of business people. And when I come back to Ireland now, as opposed to, say, even three years ago, the sense of um, the sense of optimism amongst people in business in this country is quite tangible. I mean, the business community in this country feels really agile, dynamic, um, positive and optimistic. Probably less so people in government and less so the further you go out of Dublin and Cork but, um, and, and some other cities with universities. But um, in the UK, that's just not the case. So... At a, at a high level, I have quite a lot of... And, and the second thing is, I'd say, in my experience, the UK government is much more agile in policy making than the UK. So I'm quite optimistic at one level about how Ireland's going to be affected by this. But there's absolutely no doubt that a lot of the things Ireland has traded on within the European Union and benefit from the European Union are things that Britain has supported. And Britain um, has been very powerful at the table. So we, the financial crisis has meant... I mean, the European Union was run with um, German money... French intellectual influence and sort of British mediation for the best part of 40 years um, or 30 years until the financial crisis. And post-financial crisis is German money and German intellectual influence. The Britons Brits have stepped back and the French have lost their position as, as having intellectual leadership. So, and that's, that's very damaging to the European Union, but it means that Britain's influence there is damaging. So in the area of regulation, um, I would be quite fearful that you're going to see much more political interference you know, the, <clears throat> it's very interesting, a very small issue, but, um, you know, the Bundeskartell in Germany, which is a politically independent institution with constitutional protection, has become unbelievably political in the last two or three years because, and the, the two, two very good examples of that are the Facebook privacy case. It's taking a case against Facebook on pr- abusive dominance around privacy, breaking the privacy law. And even the, out, the former head of the French Competition Authority said at a, public event I was at recently that it was not a case he would have brought in France and that was quite a sharp criticism because people don't normally say that in public um, and of course um, Madame Vestager has encouraged them and thrown lots of fuel on the fire 
And similarly, on, there's a hotel online booking case. And every other country in Europe that looked at hotel online booking came up with one answer. And the Germans came up with a very different answer. And both of those, I think, were very political. So you're seeing um, a lot of politics coming into regulation. And I think the UK has been very good on promoting independent regulation and promoting um, regulation based on consumer welfare and productivity growth. And, and that's going to go. And you're going to also see... Um, uh, for example, on things like corporate taxation, a, a, a lack of support from the UK on things like that. So I think on policy making, and Ireland has very few levers in Brexit. Um, Ireland will struggle to get its core requirements from Brexit, i.e. Northern Ireland and the border. Um, but its levers beyond that to influence the larger member states in Europe is going to be very, very low, I suspect, because it's going to use all its you know, it's considerable capital, I suspect, politically in Europe, but it's going to it's going to need all of it for some really really core things to do with Ireland, and so it's going to be difficult to win a lot of these other policy issues across Europe. And John, you've clearly identified this the, you know, the challenge for us. Is there things that we can do as regulators, as policymakers, to try and adapt to this new situation? It may not be you, you, surely there's a short term issues, but even in the medium term, how should we best try and? get as much influence as we can, albeit it'll, it'll be a challenge? I, I think um, the, 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 there are two things. One is um, Ireland, Ireland just needs to make sure that its own policy house is in order. Um, you know, the, uh, before Brexit in the UK, all the big problems confronting the British economy had nothing to do with the European Union. There was this myth put about, as among many myths, that Britain was holding, or sorry, the European Union was holding Britain back from being great. Um, but the European Union wasn't stopping Britain building a runway. It wasn't stopping Britain from improving its education system. It wasn't stopping Britain from building infrastructure, um, from relaxing the planning laws that would enable housing to be built, and the myriad other microeconomic reforms that Britain needs to do and should be doing but won't tackle because of vested interests. So, um, and in Ireland, we have similar problems. And so the, 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 the first thing should be, Ireland should be focusing on education and skills, one of the lessons from Brexit and from Trump is that you, if you don't equip your domestic population to, to be competitive globally, you're on a hiding to nothing. And Britain has a large rump of people who are abandoned in a globalised world, as does America. Ireland probably has fewer, but if we don't get that right, and everything from preschool education right through to university and lifelong learning, and reskilling people when they when industries close down and restructure. And we're very lucky in Ireland that we didn't have an industrial revolution and we bypassed, we went from agriculture to services in a way that few countries have done. Um, and therefore we, we're, we're getting that infrastructure, housing, research and development, um, you know, strong competition policy, small economy really needs strong competition policy because vested interests are always stronger in a small um, economy. And so just getting Ireland's own policy environment in order so that Ireland has talented individuals on the global stage and a really rich environment in which to do business. Um, that's going to be incredibly important. And th that is going to be an insurance policy for Ireland because you're not... Ireland can't... is not never going to be big enough to determine the terms of trade or what happens globally or the global markets in which we operate. We never have been. We've always been a price taker and we're, go we're going to be a regulation taker and a standards taker in almost every instance. So we, we need to adapt and be agile in the face of that. But having said that, I think what the regulators then should be doing is, I think, first of all, continuing to operate as though Britain's staying in the European Union is to communicate, really to communicate with business very, and, and consumers in this country about what the costs are um, and building support and building the arguments for a soft rather than a hard Brexit, say, and just being good communicators around a lot of these issues so that Ireland, so that Ireland's influence on this issue is not confined to um, the Department of Foreign Affairs and the Taoiseach's Department, but actually to the Irish diaspora in Britain and Europe, to the Irish people working in the European Commission, to Irish business trading across Europe, and just having a sort of a consistent, well-informed narrative for Ireland. And then Ireland, Ireland has a lot of um, a lot of wider, I suppose, soft power that it can use, and so if it can use that well, it could be good, but its hard power is limited. So, and I've been asking a lot of the questions here, so I want to sort of open it up to the floor to allow other people to ask some questions. But this question, I suppose, is really around a fear we have. If you look at this, effectively what we're saying is one member is leaving the club of 28 and it's going down to 27. If this doesn't, at a simple level, be a painful exercise for the person who's leaving, does that encourage other people to say, well, we leave too? 
our worry looking at that here in Ireland is that somehow we end up being collateral damage and, and, and we get more affected by that than the other the rest of the 27. <clears throat> What's your own view on that and is there any strategy we should adopt in that context? I mean, Ireland, Ireland is going to be the country most affected by Brexit. Um, the, the, um, you know, our, even Irish companies that don't export to the UK, most of their exports to the continent of Europe go through the UK because it's easier to run logistics across the UK than take everything on ferries directly to the continent. And if, you, if, if Britain's outside a customs union, that's just going to uh, provoke havoc, even just for Ireland's trade with the other 26. So... Um, uh, so Ireland's, Ireland's certainly going to be be, be adversely affected, um, and it's in uh, Ireland's interest, I think, to have the UK in a single market and to be making that case. But I'm not sure there's much more than what I've said earlier that Ireland can can do about that.